أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Uh, the format for the seminar is as follows, inshallah. We're going to start with uh, Sheikh Salim Al Amri uh, giving us a, a reminder for approximately 15 minutes, and then likewise from Sheikh Sahib Hassan. And then after that, we're going to open the floor for question and answers for approximately an hour. So this is your time to ask uh, questions, uh, particularly on the topic, inshallah. That's what we're going to prioritize. For the brothers, uh, like we've done in previous sessions, we'll have a roaming mic, and you can just raise your hands once you've prompted, inshallah, you can uh, answer, ask your question. For the sisters, there's paper going round. We have our staff that will collect this, the questions and bring them to the front of the stage here, and we will answer uh, the sisters' questions as well, inshallah. So if you have any questions, uh, please ask the staff to provide you with uh, question answer paper, inshallah. Write down your questions, uh, and we will, inshallah, endeavor to answer them, as many questions as we can, inshallah. So without further ado, inshallah, we'll hand over to uh, Sheikh Salim al -Amri. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wassalam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Wa man attaba'ahu dahi la yawm al-deen amma ba'd. The heart. This little organ in the body, in the size of your fist. When it malfunctions, when it malfunctions, it, the life ends. This organ that Allah is watching and looking at. And this is the organ that Allah is after. Allah wants your heart. Allah wants your heart. With this heart, you can be in the Firdaus, the highest level in the Jannah. And with this heart, you can be in the bottom of hellfire. May Allah save us from the hell. Amen. Amen. That's why I mentioned before that the actions of the heart are more beloved to Allah than the actions of the limbs. You can be in the Firdaus. Because of your heart. So we need to work hard on our hearts. Constantly checking our hearts. Because you know what the heart is called in Arabic? Qalb. Why is it called Qalb? The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا سُمِّيَ الْقَلْبُ مِنْ شِدَّةِ تَقَلُّبِهِ It is called Qalb. The heart and the qalb, by the way, is the core or the kernel of something. <coughs> and the heart keeps changing. It doesn't remain in one state. Today you love someone, tomorrow you hate him. Today you hate someone, tomorrow you love him. True or not? It keeps changing. And towards the end of time, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, a person will be a mu'min at night, kafir in the morning. Mu'min in the morning, covered at night. Because of the tribulations and the afflictions that are going, so you are flipping here and there. And especially at times of tribulations, people, they become confused, they don't know what to do. So who will keep this heart steadfast and remain steadfast? Only the one in heaven, that's Allah. The one who holds the hearts between two of his fingers, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why you keep crying to Allah, oh you who changes the state of the heart, keep my heart firm on the truth. The dua of the Prophet So Allah wants your heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the book, there are two types of hearts. إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَ اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ سَلِيم Heart. Healthy heart, sound heart, the heart that is free from traces of paganism, of shirk, or arrogance, or all types of diseases. This is Qalb Salim. The other type, Qalb Munib. Man khashya rahmana bil ghayb, wa jaa bi Qalb Munib. 
the one who fears Allah in secrecy. I fear him when I'm alone by myself because he's watching me. And he turns to Allah with a heart that is munib, repenting heart, broken heart, heart begging and yearning and coveting for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah, my dear brothers and sisters, is after this heart. He wants your heart. So keep working on it. And you will be surprised, brothers and sisters, that all the five senses, these openings to the external world, what you see goes to your heart and affects your heart. You see haram, it will harden your heart. You listen to the haram, it will harden your heart. You eat the haram, it will harden your heart. You touch the haram, it will harden your heart. You spoke haram, it will harden your heart. All your five senses, they affect your heart because they lead to the heart. These are windows to this external world. So if you want to soften the heart and keep it healthy, safeguards all the five senses from doing anything haram. The eye, don't look to the haram. Don't watch movies. Don't watch anything displeases Allah. Don't listen to the haram. Don't entertain backbiting and slandering. Listen to what Allah loves. That's how you protect your heart. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, and this hadith is in Sahih Muslim, Verily Allah does not, he neither looks at your, your complexion, your skin color, or stature, your physical being, nor your bodies, nor your shapes, but he looks to your hearts and your deeds. What is there in that heart? What is there in that heart? And this is the difference between us and the Sahaba. The Sahaba, they had, they had the best hearts. That's why we cannot compete with them. لو أنفق أحدكم مثل جبل أحد ذهبا ما بلغ مد أحدهم ولا نصيفا. If one of us nowadays, he spends for the cause of Allah a colossal amount of gold, Equal the size of the amount of Uhud. Can you imagine that amount of gold? That will not be equal to a handful of one of the Sahaba. How come? Handful and this mountain of gold, they're not equal? No, you cannot. Because the hearts are not the same. That is a companion. Hearts linked with Allah, attached with Allah. My dear brothers and sisters, the heart is the king, as Abu Huraira said. The heart is the king, and the rest of the organs are the soldiers. So if the king is calm, everyone is calm. The king feels secured, the subjects are secured. But if the king is shivering out of fear, imagine the subjects, right? And the fear starts where? In the heart. When you get afraid, what starts? What do you feel? The heart beats start increasing. And then commands is issued from the heart to the limbs. Run. Run. But if the king is calm, collected, the rest are under control. Are you following? See the heart of Musa alayhi salam and the hearts of Bani Israel. فَلَمَّ تَرَاءَ الْجَمْعَانِ قَالَ أَصْحَابُ مُوسَى إِنَّا 
المدركون سي نا موسى عليه السلام اند بني اسرائيل they are sandwich between the troops of the pharaoh and the sea so the followers of moses said what inna lamudrakun they are going to take us to capture us to arrest us which is a fact what did musa say kalla no they are not going to catch us what are you talking about don't you see the sea don't you see the troops but his heart is linked with allah he said kalla inna ma'ya rabbi sayahdin nay i have with me my lord allah with me he's going to guide me and the command came oh moses strike the sea with your staff and you know what happened this is the hearts that are what attached with allah the prophet sallallahu one day he entered and you know the story of Sayyidina Abu Bakr during the Hijrah, right? What Sayyidina Abu Bakr said? Oh, Rasulullah, if one of them just looks down. And by the way, there was no web spiders. There was no all that stuff, okay? Nothing. So Abu Bakr said, if one of them looks down at his feet, he would see us. What the Prophet said? Don't, don't, don't be afraid. إن الله إذ يقول لصاحبه لا تحزن إن الله معنا. Don't be afraid. Allah is with us. And when Suraq ibn Malik, you know they, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left Mecca, the Mushriks they started searching for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they said whoever brings Muhammad, dead or alive, the prize is 100 shikamal. So one of the Arabs, he was an expert, Suraq ibn Malik, an expert in tracing the footprints. And this is, by the way, a skill the Arabs still have it today. The Bedouins in the desert, he will tell you, oh, that's the footprint of so and so. Subhanallah. So he traced the Prophet and Abu Bakr. So Abu Bakr, he looked back and he said, oh, Prophet of Allah, there is a knight Postman chasing us. He said, carry on, carry on. Don't worry. Heart is collected, calm. Don't worry. What happened? Imagine now the horseman is riding his horse, is about to catch them. All the four of the horse sank in a rocky land, rocky land, sank, and he was thrown off the saddle. He got up. He mounted his horse. The same thing happened three times. The Prophet ﷺ looked back. Suraqa, you cannot catch us. Go back. You want the hundred camels, right? I will give you something better than the hundred, hundred camels. You will have the bangles, the bracelets of the king of Persia, the emperor of Persia. They will be yours. Allahu Akbar. He is wanted chased and he is promising the bangers the bracelets of the king of persia and the years passed and the prophet ﷺ passed away and the muslims took persia and during the reign of umar ibn khattab the bracelets of the emperor were brought to medina and umar ibn khattab said suraqa ibn malik became a muslim oh suraqa where are you here I am. Get up. Give me your hands. Wear them. This is what Muhammad promised you. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When the heart is attached with Allah, you don't worry about anything. So Allah looks at your heart. The Muslim scholars, the ulama, they have classified the hearts into three types. There are three types of hearts. Qalb Shaqeem or Qalb Salim, which is the healthy, clean heart. Qalb Mayyit, may Allah save us from having such hearts. Dead heart. Dead heart. And this is the heart of the one who doesn't remember Allah. No dhikr, your heart is dead. 
You want to revive your heart? The dhikr. Keep your tongue busy with the dhikr and remembrance of Allah. And the third type of heart is qalb saqeem, sick heart. This is the heart that is running after lusts, desires. The heart is just looking for desires. So it is a sick heart. You need to work on it. Because as you know, my dear brothers and sisters, a human being, two parts. Body and soul. You feed the body by the material food. How about the soul? Its food is spiritual. Through the ibadah. That's why you will have this vacuum inside you. Spiritual vacuum. And you don't know how to fill it. By drugs? Doesn't work. Women? Doesn't work. Out? No. You know the Scandinavian countries, they have the highest rate of suicide among the youth? I think Sweden, they had the highest one. The youth! Why do the youth kill themselves? And Scandinavian countries, everything you can. You can have, you know, the drugs in the menu. You know that. In the menu. So everything is there. So why do they kill themselves, the youth? Why do they kill themselves? Because they're fed up. The, the soul is crying. The soul is crying. And this vacuum is getting bigger and bigger. Don't think by committing haram you are <laughs> solving the problem. No, it becomes worse. And your misery is increasing. So the only way to cool this crying soul is through this spiritual, give her the spiritual sustenance, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then and only then this balance will take place, body and soul. If there is imbalance within yourself, then your life will be miserable life. And I conclude with the saying of Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala. He said, Shaitan, your enemy, can only reach your heart through two gates. There are two gates only, two doors. If you lock them, you will be all right. Are you ready to lock the two doors? Inshallah. Door number one, the door of doubts. The shaitan comes and casts and throws doubts into your mind. The shaitan and his followers, of course. Oh, do you know that your prophet married more than four? And the Quran is saying only four. Why is he not following the Quran? Ah. Uh -huh. uh, I never thought about it. <laughs> you know, you have a point. So that means he managed to put the seed of doubt into your mind. What should I do in this case? I'll give you the remedy. Easy, very easy. When someone tries to put the seed of doubt into your mind and you don't have any answer, what should you do? Shame on me. I'm ignorant. I know what you are saying is wrong. And I know there is an answer for your question. But shame in me. I don't have that. I'll come back to you. By just saying this, you stopped him from planting the seed of doubt into your heart. You didn't give him the chance. You didn't give him the chance. Then you ask the ulama, you call the sheikh, you call money. Scholars, you send an email, you get the answer. This is the answer for your question. So the heart, that get door remains locked, closed. Are you ready to do this? When you don't know, say, I don't know. But I am sure what you are saying is wrong. I'm sure about it. I'll come back to you. The second thing, the second door, is the door of 
desires, and this is the problem of many people, especially the young ones, even us, you know, old people as well. Desires, lusts, shahawat. This is a problem. So now, what is the remedy for the doubts? Any idea? Remedy for the doubts? Knowledge. Knowledge. Education. What is the remedy for the desires? Taqwa. Fear of Allah. Always remember what Allah has prepared for you is better than the pleasures of this world. Always remember that. Alcohol is the alcohol which people are drinking. Is it like the fruit cocktail? That's sweet? No. Oh, they tell you it's not sweet. But they just drink it so that it will intoxicate them and that so they can forget their problems. But the problems remain. So Allah, when He prohibited you from drinking alcohol, He will give you another khamr in the Jannah. Laddatan lil sharibin. When you are sipping not only one bottle, you have what? Rivers. Can you imagine rivers in your mansions, in your palace, just within reach? River of wine, honey, milk, drink. So if you have the taqwa, you should know that what Allah prepared is better than what you have in this world. Women, there are women there in the Jannah. So everything is there, better than what is here in this dunya. So the taqwa, the fear of Allah. So lock the two doors, the door of doubts by the ilm and the door of lusts and desires by the taqwa. May Allah protect all of us. Amen. Jazakallah khair. Sheikh. We'll hear from uh, now our Sheikh, Sheikh Zaheb Hassan, inshallah, uh, for around 10 to 15 minutes. Jazakallah khair. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, I thank brother Salim Al-Amri he made my task easy because he has mentioned many good things in his uh, in his speech about the kinds of the hearts and uh, it reminded me of uh, another classification of the hearts as far as uh, accepting the truth is concerned, as far as uh, accepting someone else as well, as far as accepting someone's evidence, arguments as well. So this classification uh, is a bit different. There are hearts who are just empty. There is nothing in it. So they will accept the first thing which entered to these hearts, and here I remember uh, this uh, line of poetry. The Arab poet is saying, "Atani hawaha qabla an arif al hawa, fasada fakalban farigan fatamakana." Atani hawaha qabla an arif al hawa. Her desire came to me before I could even know what is the desire. Fasada fakalban farigan fatamakana. Then it hit an empty heart, so straight away it entered into it. That is Qalbun Farid, the empty heart. Empty heart, empty from, from doubts, empty from nifaq, empty from any, any vicious thought. That is going to accept the truth right in the beginning. And that was the example of those, those Sahaba Ridwanullah Ta'ala Alayhim Ajmain who entered into Islam in the beginning. Like Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, not even just one doubt came to his mind about Islam. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa invited him to Islam and he said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. No doubt came to him at all. These are uh, the good souls and the highest type of souls. And this is why they are known to be as sabiqun as sabiqun ulaik al muqarrabun They are the foremost and foremost and they are the first one to enter into al-Jannah. So this is the first kind of, uh, of heart. Now, there are hearts where there is uh, doubts. And uh, as for uh, 
Sheikh Salim al Amri has mentioned, he has mentioned those hearts which are uh, afflicted with the doubts. And then you have to, this is now the duty of the scholars of Islam who got the knowledge to dispel these doubts with their knowledge. Because knowledge is the only thing, it is a light which can take away the darkness. This is why when you invite what is Islam, you say, Allah basiratin ana wa man ittaba'ani. I stand upon basira, upon a clear knowledge, clear sight, clear insight, myself and those who follow me. So this knowledge is needed. And uh, this is why uh, in Islam, knowledge got a very, very high position, especially the knowledge, the source of knowledge, Al-Quran and Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, you have to have this type of knowledge. Very recently I was uh, in a conference in, in Pakistan, in Islamabad. So, there a person met me and he reminded me something. It is not like a uh, praiseworthy remarks for myself, but I just uh, uh, remembered uh, this event, uh, this, uh, this conversation from that person. And, uh, he said to me that you have a great favor upon me. Uh, I don't remember. I said, what is the favor? What have I done? He reminded me that I was a Christian. I was a Christian because uh, in a Muslim society, those people who turn into Christianity, normally they are from Muslim families. But because of the missionaries, they turn into Christianity. So this person was one of them. And he said that I was asking a question. I have asked this question many, many scholars. And I did not uh, get the answer. You gave me the answer and this is why I turned back to Islam. I entered back to Islam. So I said once again, what was the question and was the, what was the answer? Because I don't remember. So he said that because Muslims, they always claim this Quran is preserved. The Qur'an is preserved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhun. We have uh, revealed it, a dhikr which is Al-Qur'an, and we are going to preserve it. And I used to say that our books, our books are also preserved. So, how could you say that your book is preserved and our book Bible is not preserved? That is the question I have asked many scholars. And uh, then, you gave me the answer that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Ma'idah, he mentioned about the previous books, that to preserve the previous books, the task is given to their scholars. Because the words are, بِمَسْتُحْفِذُ مِنْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ بِمَسْتُحْفِذُ مِنْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ Because they are given the task to preserve the book. So because it was given to the human beings, they were not able to, to preserve it. Unlike Al-Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this guarantee that I have revealed it and I am going to preserve it. So this is why Quran was preserved and the other book were not preserved. So Alhamdulillah, I said, uh, Alhamdulillah that he has uh, given you once again uh, Al-Hidayah to Al-Islam. So doubts, doubts come to the mind and you have to expel these doubts. The other thing is uh, the heart in which there is hypocrisy and nifaq. These are the, yeah, you can say, uh, the hardest one, the hardest one. Because with nifaq, a person uh, got so many interests. And this is why he does not want to come back to, to the truth. And the Prophet wasallam has to tackle these munafiqeen uh, in al-Madinah. And that was, as I said, the hardest part of his life. So what is the treatment of a nifaq? When you read, uh, for example, uh, Surah Al-Hadid, and then you will find that a nifaq is treated by al-infaq. Nifaq by infaq. Infaq means to spend. To spend in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because a munafiq who loves uh, the material world, he is not going to spend. So that is the treatment given to him. Spend, spend in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا لَكُمْ لَا تُنْفِقُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَلِلَّهِ مِرَاسُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْعَرْضِ 
لا يستوي منكم من انفق من قبل الفتح وقاتل اولئك اعظم درجه من الذين انفقوا من بعد وقاتلوا وكل وعد الله الحسنى والله بما تعملون خبير so this is this is the remedy remedy for nifaq spend in the way of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and allah is uh, will bring back to to you to the guidance now the fourth type of uh, hearts that is very common where there is a dislikeness developed in your heart and here i would mention the case of the spouses the case of the husband and wife normally when this type of hatred develops in the heart they start uh, going drifting away from each other and then it comes to to talaq it comes to to divorce and that is very common two friends very good friends but uh, because of uh, any dispute among them th they develop this hatred in their hearts and then they become enemies to each other that is something very common and this is why we have to find out the remedies for this type of alkaraha or dislikeness now here we have to see the seerah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the seerah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam one thing is very noticeable not only to talk not only to talk but a physical contact with the other party a physical contact by hand a physical contact by embracing that we find that is going to sometime create miracles fazara he may be fazara ibn ubaid or someone else anyhow this person wanted to kill the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that time when prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came for umrah in the 7th year of hijra Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is inside Makkah inside Al Kaaba and this fazara has planned to kill the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he got a dagger in his pocket somewhere in his pocket and he is just watching for the right moment to kill the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam knew knew by revelation that this is his intention he passed by him Fazara what are you thinking Fazara became alert prophet is in front of him he said nothing i am just remembering allah he said no no you have come for something else you yeah, you want to kill me and fazara became quiet and then prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam placed his hand on his heart sorry on your shoulder and the heart is far away i don't know where it is <laughs> he placed his hand on his heart and fazara became just submitted to him completely he was changed completely by this placing of the hand of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam on his heart he said he was the most disliked person to me after that i found him the most like person to me and he said o oh prophet ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu he became muslim he became muslim so this physical contact it it creates it creates miracles you are sometime a dragon's drawn with your wife each one of you are talking rubbish in a vulgar language all right try to find out a remedy for that there are so many remedies there are people come to us uh, to solve their problems and one of the remedy is remind each one of them all right think about the good characters in the other party ask the woman what are the good things in your husband first she would say nothing oh there is nothing good this man is a, a vicious person <coughs> no man does he beat you no he does not beat me all right that is the the worst thing a man becomes aggressive and he is not aggressive so it means that he got a good quality in him he does not raise his hand upon you think about some some other qualities as well now she will think 
and she will bring some more qualities. Yes, in the very same way we ask the man, what are the good qualities in your, in your wife? First of all, he would uh, portrait her just like a jinni, uh, just like a jinni. But later, he would remember some good characters of, of his wife as well. Now, in this way, we try to bring them closer. And then, if uh, you see that the differences between two of them are becoming lesser, becoming lesser and lesser, then there is a way for reconciliation. All right, man, have you ever brought uh, a gift for your wife? Why should I bring, bring a gift for her? Why? Huh? She is my wife. All right, to win her heart, bring some gift from time to time. Yes, a small gift is going to change her mind, change her heart. Long ago when, uh, uh, when I was uh, a student in, in Pakistan, I have read a story that is uh, from, the Western, from the Western literature, uh, but anyhow the gist of that story was that here there is the husband and wife. And both of them are thinking that how can I please my spouse? The husband thinks, yes, my wife got long hair, so I should buy a comb. Uh, a comb so she can, uh, she can use that comb in, in her hairs. So he goes with little money he got. He, they were not uh, uh, rich people, hmm? not like you rich people. They were poor people. So, and so he bought with the few money he got a comb. And the woman was thinking how to please, hmm? how to please uh, the man. And this is why she said that if, uh, yani if I cut short my hairs, if I cut my hairs and sell my hairs, because there may be some people who, who would buy these, uh, these hairs, I can buy some gift for him. So she cut short of her hairs and uh, she bought uh, a ring or something else for him. He brought a comb and now she got no hair at all. <laughs> Uh, the present did not hit the target, uh, uh, but there was a great sacrifice on both parts. They were happy. They were happy. With small gifts, they were happy in their house. So try to, to buy your wife a gift from time to time. That is going to win her heart. And the main thing is this tongue. This tongue. Don't use that vulgar language. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيزَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكُ فَعَفُ عَنْهِمْ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ وَشَابِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَرْمْ فَإِذَا أَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ That is because of the mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you became so soft for them. If you were very Harsh in your language, غليظ القلب, very hard in your heart. لن فضل من حولك, من حولك, they must have run away from you. And that is true. You think that uh, by saying some bad words or hard words, you have taken vengeance of your heart? No. But you can't uh, win the heart of the other person. You can only win the heart of the other person with, with a soft word. This is why the Prophet said that if two friends, they are not ha happy with each other, they don't talk with each other, they are only allowed three days. After three days they should come. And the first one or the best one among them who starts with salam, who starts with salam, who says assalamu alaikum first. And the other person is still so angry, he would turn his turn his head, huh? turn his, he will not say assalamu alaikum, no, say wa alaikum assalam, and then wa tasafaha, or ya tasafahan, they shake hand with each other, again, shake hand with each other, see, hands are touching, the, the hand is touching the hand of the other person, that is going to create this electric shock, which will bring him closer, and if he is very intimate, embrace him, that will bring him closer. 
This is the treatment which is given by the Prophet ﷺ. Try to use that, that treatment and you will see that you are going to win your heart. And anyhow, uh, Quran has also mentioned uh, the case of Al-Mu'allafati Qulubuhum. Those people whose hearts are to be one. And they are the one category out of the eight categories of those people who deserve your zakat. Eight categories in the ayah 60 of Surah At-Tawbah. So one of the eight categories is وَالْمُعَلَّفَةِ قُلُوبُهُمْ Those people whose hearts are going to be one. Yani th those people who are on the edge, standing at the edge of kufr and Islam. And if you just try to win their heart, give them some zakat money. And because of that zakat money, because of that help, they would enter into Islam. Even giving money, that, that would help as well. Especially for those people who are in need of money. And that applies to, to every person who, who dislikes you. And he is in need. And then you help him, even though he does not know. You help him at the time of the need, then he becomes your friend indeed. I know that uh, the time has expired. Thank you. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Brothers and sisters, we're now going to take question and answers uh, for the next 45 minutes or so, inshallah. Uh, just a reminder for the sisters, if you have any questions, please write them down um, and pass them to your, the staff, the stewards, and then we, they will uh, forward them on to us, inshallah, and we will uh, take the questions. Uh, for brothers, please raise your hand, inshallah. There will be a roaming mic that will uh, come round, so when prompted, inshallah, you can ask your question, inshallah. Uh, I'm going to take the first uh, question here we have uh, for Sheikh Salim from the sister's side. How do you know that your heart is a healthy heart? How do you know that your salah and other ibadah acts that you are performing is being accepted? Alhamdulillah. Uh, first of all, the Sheikh Zalla Khair also, he mentioned many th good things and he reminded me See, when the Prophet Sallallahu he touched the heart of the man, also there is another incident. A young man came to the Prophet Sallallahu and he said, Oh Prophet of Allah, give me permission to commit zina, to, adult, to commit adultery. Imagine, someone comes to the Shaykh, Shaykh, give me green light, I want to commit zina. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, come n n close to me, come. He said, do you accept this for your mother? He said, no. He said, the people, they don't like it for their mothers. Do you accept it for your sister? Do you accept it for your daughter? And then he put his hand on the heart of the young man, and he said what? Allahumma tahir qalba wa hassin farja. O Allah, purify his heart and protect his private part. That is what the Prophet ﷺ did. Sheikh also mentioned some tips, okay, how to have successful, happy marital life. We need to lend our ears to them when they are talking. Your wife is talking to you, just listen. Just pay attention. Let her finish. And don't comment, huh? You are right. I'm mistaken. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah feek. Don't argue. Yes, listen. Let her talk. Not that you are interrupting her. The, the, the gift also brings love. And from time to time, you, you need to do it. Come home, guess what I have. <laughs> guess what I have. Mm, mm. Sometimes their expectations, they go high. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right? Yes. And you should, the sister, please appreciate. Even if we, sometimes we don't have taste, you know. Okay, we don't have this. So I, I didn't pick something yet that, but you say, wow, it's nice. Uh, let me feel so good also. Huh? All right. Also, I was in the States 
in Boston, and the brothers, they were complaining about the sisters. And they said, we want you to talk to them. I said, yes, okay, don't worry. Because, you know, the brothers in, in Boston, mashallah, one of them, he said, it is sunnah to give her a bunch. <laughs> they said, where? He said, you know, the Prophet Wasallam came and Aisha, when Aisha followed him on the night when he went to the graveyard and he came back and he hit her. He said, he hit her? What did the Prophet Wasallam say to Aisha? What did he say? When Aisha came back, because Aisha felt jealous. Hmm? Aisha. She thought that he went to one of his wives on, his, on her night and the moon was full. And she found the Prophet ﷺ raising his hands, praying for the pe dead people in Baqiya. He said, oh my God, you are somewhere and I'm somewhere else. So she came out running, and she was breathless, and she entered the room and covered herself. But she was breathless, her tummy going up and down. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Aisha, were you the one? I saw the shadow. She was uh, uh, reluctant. He told her, tell me the truth, or Allah will inform me now. And she said, yes. He said, Aisha. He didn't say Aisha. This is beautiful in Arabic. Called Tarkhim. He said, Ya Aishu. Diminutive in English. It means, O oh, cutie. <laughs> yes. Were you the one? And he said this, like this. Were you the one? Do you think I will be unfair to you? And let your shaitan played with your mind. He said, I have shaitan. He said, everyone. He said, including you. He said, yes. But mine, either he's a Muslim, became Muslim, or he cannot harm me. <laughs> See? Learn from the Prophet ﷺ. These are marital tips. Also, the sisters, so this, to cut it short, the sisters, when I gave them the talk, and I said, this is what the husband, your, your husbands are saying. They said, and what is your problem? They said, one of them. The Americans, they're so frank. He said, romance. <laughs> we want romance. I said, okay, I'll pass the message. <laughs> okay. I came to the brother. I said, brothers, everyone should go and buy a bouquet of flowers tonight. <laughs> they like these things. She wants to hear from you. Love, I love you. They want to, she wants to hear it. We men, how we express our love for our wives? Through gifts, right? Because we are from Mars, you know that. <laughs> That's how we express our love. And we think the messy reach, that I love you, that's why I'm buying this thing. No, she wants you to hear it from you. So don't be shocked or surprised if she comes to you, stands in front of you like a child. They love me. <laughs> and you go, huh? <laughs> yes. You'll be shocked. What? All these things I'm doing are enough. That's how I express my love. No, she wants to hear it from you. I love you. Also, one day, one day, I, uh, Fatima, Fatima, Imagine Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet she got angry with her husband, Ali. And Ali left the house. So Fatima made Ali angry. So if she makes you angry, don't go. It's okay, we are in the same boat. Okay? You know the, the man who came to complain about his wife to Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab? When he reached the door of Umar, he heard the, her, his, Umar's wife screaming. Screaming at Umar. He said, Okay, it is happening in every house. Okay, fine. <laughs> so he left. He, he, he went back. Sayyidina Umar opened the door. Brother, come. What's the problem? No, nothing, nothing, nothing. No, no, just come, come, come. <laughs> he said, Why Allah, I came to complain about my wife, but I found you that you have the same thing. So, okay. <laughs> okay. Sayyidina Umar, listen to what Sayyidina Umar said. Mentioning the good things about his wife. He said, listen, she cooks for me. She takes care of my children, takes care of the daily chores, and he starts listing her daily chores and the things she is doing. If she flows up from time to time, I have to take it. 
This is life. This is life. <clears throat> so Ali, he left angry. The Prophet ﷺ came. Fatima, where is your husband? He left the house. The Prophet ﷺ knew where to find him. He went to the masjid. So when you get angry, where should you go? To the masjid. Or take wudu. Pray to rakaz. Especially when the anger has its peak. And she is shouting at you. And sometimes she will be telling you, divorce me. I don't want to live with you anymore. You know what she means? Does she mean it? She means, love me more. And I'm sure they are nodding their heads right now. <laughs> That's what they mean. She doesn't mean divorce me. And she might challenge you. Divorce me if you are a man. No, I'm not a man. But I'm not. Okay, I'm not going to divorce you. <laughs> Leave the house. She will chase you. Run after you. Coward, come back. Yes, I'm coward. I'm leaving. <laughs> Go till things cool down. Go to the masjid. Don't go to another brother. Driving with the motorway. Speeding up. Knocking on his door. Getting inside. <sighs> blowing air. What's wrong with your brother? Women, no one can stand them. <laughs> Said, okay. Don't worry about that. I'll give you the cure. A cure of a woman? Another woman. <laughs> okay. Did he help you? <laughs> no. He didn't. So Ali radiallahu anhu, he went to the masjid. He prays to Raqqa and he slept. The Prophet asked where he went. Sayyidina Ali was asleep. The, the kafa fell off his, uh, of, of his face. He was covering his face. His cheek was in the dust. The Prophet tapped his shoulder. Oh, father of dust, get up. He went back. Salamu alaykum. Alaykum salam. Everything is fine. Everything is fine. Regarding the question about the hearts, it is indeed a topic in itself. But you can find your heart, I mean, you can know about your heart if the sin, if you do a sin, it hurts the heart. And you hurt yourself. That means there is still some life in this, in this heart. But if you are doing the sins and they don't affect your heart anymore, it is dead. If seeing the haram doesn't affect you anymore, it is dead. Brothers and sisters, when you go for Umrah for two weeks or three weeks, and the first, when you come back, you land in Heathrow, and you start seeing the other things, what do you feel? What your heart does? The act, astaghfirullah. What is this? Because you managed through these three weeks to bring life back to your, to your heart. But then, a few days later, back to square one. Okay? The heart gets dead again. So you know, if the haram affects, when you see something wrong, affects you, alhamdulillah, your heart is still alive. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, if the evil doesn't move your heart, then you have no iman in your heart. Even you don't have a weight of the mustard seed of iman in your heart. When the wrong, the haram becomes a norm in your life. It doesn't, it doesn't harm you, it doesn't affect you. So that means the heart has died. So if you want to maintain your heart healthy, safeguard the five senses. Worship Allah. Dua. Give yourself dhikr constantly. Your tongue is busy with the dhikr. Istighfar. The life will come back to your heart. May Allah keep our hearts alive. Amen. Amen. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Uh, we'll take a question from the brother's side, inshallah. So, if you can have the mic here. The shit okay. To be fair. No, no problem. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, 
The question I got is for, um, for basically for River Brothers like myself. Uh, you mentioned earlier on that, um, that you should not let your heart be uh, shut over by doubt. Um, I gotta say that when we, uh, I'm of myself, when I left the Christian faith, um, I left it very heavily with a lot of evidence. When I entered Islam, I had to <clears throat> have the same criteria into the religion. So you found that I had a lot of questions prior to what was distorted in the previous books that I'm reading. Um, so uh, how do you distinguish between the, the, the difference between a doubt and seeking knowledge? Because at some point, I'm going to have questions, the same question as what you asked earlier on um, when you spoke about um, the doubt. Remember you spoke about, about doubt earlier on? So how do you distinguish you know, between doubt and actually generally wanting to know a question? Because it, it wouldn't make any sense if I just went to religion and I just accepted everything because I'd have questions. Because like I told you, I left the religion prior to that with questions. So I needed these questions answered. Sure. Sure. Uh, can you explain it further, this question? Yeah, I think the brother's asking about when he, he's uh, finding new knowledge. How do, can he ask about these doubtful matters? Is, is that permissible or is this, uh, should he refrain from asking about these issues? Uh, of course, uh, the doubts are created by the Satan to take you away from Islam once again because Islam is the best gift which is given to you and he does not want you to retain that gift. So he will, uh, he will create so many, so many doubts in your mind. So you have to, you, you, you have to, it is just like uh, in, this, uh, in, this, in this country you got no experience of, of flies. Huh? But uh, in other countries, in summer weather, other weather, a lot of flies, and we have to use a fan uh, just to expel these flies. So in the same way, fly, doubts are just like flies who are going to attack you, and you have to expel them with, uh, with your fan. And this is the fan of the knowledge. So you have to, because uh, there is no other way to expel the doubts except with, with the knowledge. And uh, knowledge is, of course, uh, that is also related with al-hikmah and uh, I have said in, in the last, in a previous speech as well that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he said Udu'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal mu'izati al-hasana wa jadilhum billati hiya ahsan So you have to use hikmah and wisdom and uh, good uh, piece of admonition and argument but in the best way and this is how to, to expel the doubts. Uh, for example, right during the time of the Sahaba, Rizwanullah ta'ala alayhim ajma'in, a faction which is known as Al-Khawarij, they sprang up and uh, they were against Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Muawiyah. Why? They have accepted arbitration. They have accepted some human beings as their arbiter. This is their point. They said that uh, Quran says, in hukmu illa lillah, judgment is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how could you declare, how could you declare a man, a human being as uh, the one to arbitrate for you? So that was a great doubt, great doubt in their mind. And because of that, they, you know, even because of their thought or their uh, thinking, they came to kill Sayyidina Ali. The one who came, one who killed Sayyidina Ali, Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim, he was a Khariji. At the same time, the same night, three of them, they came, one to kill Sayyidina Ali and he was successful. The other came to kill Sayyidina Muawiyah, but uh, he was not able to, to kill him, but to injure him. And the third one in, in Egypt, Amr ibn As, and Amr ibn As did not come for uh, Fajr prayer because the time was fixed for Fajr prayer. He did not come for uh, Fajr prayer. Someone else came <laughs> as his deputy, his name was Khariza and he was killed because he thought that this is Amr ibn As. So these people, they got big doubts in their mind. Sayyidina Ali has to fight them. There is a famous fighting known as uh, Al-Nahrawan, the, the fight of Al-Nahrawan, where there were 12,000 Khariji, 12,000 Khariji. Sayyidina Ali, before fighting them, he sent Abdullah ibn Abbas just to argue with them. And Abdullah ibn Abbas said to them, listen to me. And uh, what, what, are your, what are your doubts? And then they place uh, the same argument that how did you accept a human being as your arbiter? And uh, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas 
uh, brought the argument from Al Quran. He said that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wanted two arbiters if there is a dispute between husband and wife. Hmm? As in uh, Surah An Nisa, that if you got dispute between husband and wife, فَبَعْسُ حَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهِ وَحَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهَا إِنْ يُرِيدَ إِسْلَاحًا يُوَفِّقِ اللَّهُ بَيْنَهُمَا. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has uh, has ordered us to bring hakam, our arbiters from both sides, to bring uh, the both parties uh, nearer to each other. And in the very same way, in, uh, in the matter of, uh, in some rulings of al-hajj, when a person in the state of Iram has killed uh, a game, then he has to give a kafara. A kafara similar, yani an animal similar to the one he killed. So if he has killed, for example, a deer, then he has to offer a sacrifice in the shape of, uh, of a sheep. And if it is a zebra, for example, then he has to, to kill something similar to zebra, means a cow. And if it is a bigger animal, then he has to uh, sacrifice a camel. So to decide which type of camel, which type of animal this person has to kill or has to offer as a sacrifice, that was left to two arbiters as well. So Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas told them that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to accept arbitration in the matter of a dispute between two spouses, in the matter of, uh, uh, of fidya in, uh, in hajj, then why not in such a big matter where we, we got dispute? So when he brought all these arguments, around uh, uh, 4,000 of them retreated and uh, they, they, they left uh, their group and they repented. So expelling the doubts with hikmah, with wisdom, with knowledge, that is, uh, that is, that is very vital. And uh, this, this can only be done by those people who got the knowledge of Quran and Sunnah. So there is nothing wrong if any doubts come to your mind and if it is affecting your Iman, then ask, ask, uh, ask, ask the question. Uh, it was not allowed during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala told them not to ask a lot of questions hmm? because, because of their questioning, because revelation was still coming and it was feared that these people, if they keep on asking questions unnecessarily, the ruling will become harder and harder, harder and harder. But now, when there is no more revelation, we know what is Quran, we know what is Sunnah, then there is nothing wrong if any doubt comes to your mind ask this question, ask a knowledgeable person and uh, inshallah if you got satisfaction that is good if not, uh, then come to brother Salim al-Amri, uh, inshallah he will give you a good answer Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Salim a question from the sisters, she's saying um, that uh, once she's committed a sin and then she has seeken, sought forgiveness for that but after that time these thoughts about that sin still appear in her head in her mind uh, does that mean that her sin is not forgiven? Mm. <clears throat> yes, I'd like to add something to the previous question. The, uh, and this is for everyone. Brothers, you should have contacts with the ulama. You should have contacts, the contacts of the scholars. So when you have a doubt, you pick up the phone and ask the sheikh. Also, you need to make time to educate yourself and go regularly and attend study circles. It is high time to learn your deen, your Islam. It is a must. It is fard. The enemies, your enemies who are trying to cast the doubts into your mind, they will only come to those who do not know the deen. They are hunting in troubled water, always. They will not come to Sheikh Suhaib. They will not come to the people who are knowledgeable. They will not come to them. Because they know they will be muzzled. They know they will be refuted. They know their ignorance will be exposed. So they will not come to the people of knowledge. So you need to have contacts with the ulama. And there are, mashallah, good websites on the net. And the emails of the scholars where you can send your question and it will be answered inshallah but don't entertain the doubts in the mind that's why immediately say 
Shame on me. I am ignorant. I know there is an answer, and you find the answer. Is this clear? Regarding the uh, someone and, and uh, committed a sin and repented, but still, sometimes that the uh, the scene, okay, is redisplayed. So you are visualizing it. Don't do that. You see, Shaitan is a crafty guy. Yes, indeed he is. He's the most experienced guy. You know his bio data? <laughs> How many years of experience Shaitan got? Thousands and thousands of years. So he knows. Okay? That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, huh? a man and a woman, if they are together, the third one is the Shaitan. Because naturally they will not be talking about recipes, right? Will they? What they will be talking about? Huh? So, Shaitan has his own plan, his own way. So that's why evil thoughts, they come. They do come. Okay? Many things, they cross our minds. And alhamdulillah, Allah will not hold us accountable for that. For these evil thoughts. Many funny things, okay? But what should you do when this evil thought comes? You ward it off by saying, A'udhu Billah min shaitan. Oh Allah, I seek your protection from the shaitan. So it goes. But if you start to entertain the idea, now it's getting deeper inside. And maybe now you'll start getting a sense of pleasure. Are you following? And then you want to manifest it, manifest that pleasure, and experience that pleasure. And it started only with an idea in the mind. So don't conceive that idea into your mind. Immediately get rid of it. Wash it away. That's why <clears throat> for the brothers and sisters who repented, Try to get rid of anything that might remind you about that sin. Get rid of anything that will remind you about your girlfriend. Or the correspondence, or the love letters, and emails, and all that stuff. Get rid of it. Burn it. Even your SIM card, change it. Cut relation completely. Your friends, change them. Don't stay with them. You should have a new group of friends. And don't go back to them. Maybe now you feel, MashaAllah, I am coming from Jimas, my Iman is a... So I want them to, to feel the same thing. I'm telling you, don't go. They said, brothers, you know... I uh, say, come on. Oh. Overnight you became sheikh? <laughs> come on, come on, come on. <laughs> huh? So don't go back. Don't go back. Or they call you. They will not leave you alone, true? They will be running after you. Oh, at least, at least give us nasiha, brother. Advise us. No, no, no. I just want to save myself first. So anything that will remind you about the sins, just get rid of it and bury it and forget about it. And the shaitan tries to bring these things back, seek, seek Allah's protection and still fall. Because the shaitan will keep reminding you about these things and by the time you will forget about it, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save all of us. Amen. Uh, if I yeah. may uh, add something, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned about uh, three major sins in Surah Al-Furqan and the person who repents, Allah is going to turn their evil things into good actions. وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرٍ وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا يَزْنُونَ وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ يَلْقَ أَثَامًا 
يضاعف له العذاب يوم القيامة ويخلد فيه مهانا إلا من تاب وآمن وعمل عملا صالحا فأولئك يبدل الله سيئاتهم حسنات وكان الله غفور رحيم These three sins which are mentioned that is the sin of shirk and uh, the sin of killing and the sin of zina, adultery, committing adultery that uh, those people who are Ibadur Rahman the real servants of they don't do it they don't do it so the one who does it and then he repents repents and then he revives his faith illa man taba wa amana wa amila amalan salihan repentance revival of faith and then doing good deeds allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said fa ulaika yubaddilullahu sayyi'atihim hasanat allah is going to change to convert to convert their bad deeds into good deeds so here comes this question here comes this question the person who got many sins and then he repented and uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that all his previous sins will turn into good deeds so it means that if he has done a million sins now he got million good deeds unlike a person a good person like you who did not commit any sin at all so in his case there is uh, uh, no sin which can be converted into good deeds so he would be lesser in the scale of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the person who sin uh, sin a lot so this question may come to your mind and the answer to that is that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that he is going to change their bad deeds into good actions what does it mean whenever this person re remembers his good his bad action his sin for example committing adultery fornication at once he would say astaghfirullah 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 what I, what I have done astaghfirullah by saying astaghfirullah now a good action is recorded in his in his uh, uh, amal or in his uh, paper of action so whenever he says remembering that sin astaghfirullah another good action is recorded in this way where, uh, his remembering of the sin will turn into a good action for himself so that's, that is uh, the, the the right way for a person whenever as uh, brother Salim has said first of all try to not to remember these things and uh, try to expel them away from you but even if you remember then say astaghfirullah astaghfirullah and inshallah you will have uh, one good action recorded in uh, your amal and that that inshallah secure you your jannah jazakumullah jazakallah khair we're going to take a question from the brother side this young man over here inshallah assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam how do you know when Allah is forgiving you? What? what is the question? How do you know when Allah has forgiven you? Has Allah has forgiven you? Yes. Ah, yes. I need to, to know that uh, your action is accepted. Your action is accepted. Always check uh, your own condition. For example, you want to know you have done your hajj. And you want to know that your hajj is accepted by Allah SWT or not check yourself when you come back if you are now in a better position religion wise first you were not regular at your prayer after Hajj you became regular at your prayer first you were not reading Quran a lot now you are reading Quran a lot first you got a lot of, uh, of anger now you got less anger this is the token this is the sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted your Hajj has accepted your Hajj in the very same way whatever action you do if you come a better person after that this is a token that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven you this is uh, the criterion how you can judge yourself Jazakallah khair uh, a question for Sheikh Salim al uh, from the sister's side um, a sister's mentioning that she suffers from waswasa um, and uh, finishing her prayer sometimes she's not sure if she is concentrated well or not uh, what advice do you have to avoid uh, the whispering and, and to improve her concentration in prayer? Before answering this question, I would like to add that the ulama, they mentioned that when we uh, <clears throat> repent and every time, for every sin you have to repent for every sin and ask Allah forgiveness for every sin you committed. Okay, you know this sin you committed so you ask Allah forgiveness for this particular sin. You mention it. 
Oh Allah, forgive me this and that. And if the sins are so many, then you ask Allah to forgive all your sins. And if remembering your sins motivates you to do more deeds, that's fine. As Imam Ibn Qayyim said. He said, if remembering, disobeying Allah motivates you because that makes you feel guilty, so you do more good deeds and to please Allah and to compensate for your sins, that's fine. But if remembering your sins make you yearn and covet to do the haram, then you should not remember what you have done in the past. Just forget about it and never mention it. Regarding the wiswas, that is what the shaitan is there for. That's his job. You know khinzib, right? You know khinzib? This is one of the shayateen. His, his, his task, that the moment you say Allahu Akbar, he comes and sits on your shoulder. That's his job. And now he starts reminding you. And that's why I mentioned many times, and maybe last year, that we do the shopping while we are in the salah. You know that? Our shopping, we do it in the, in the salah. He reminds you about everything in the salah. The family, your wife, she wants this and this and this and this and that. Or the shaitan comes to you. Oh, there's nice Persian carpet in front of you. So he said, wow, how did they make it? <laughs> and now he takes you. He just gives you the idea and he leaves you. Huh? And now you are there in Asfahan, in Persia, and you are in the factory and seeing the carpets, the assembly line, and the Imam, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah, and you are still in the factory. <laughs> See the shaitan? But you realize, oh, this is, you are playing with me. A'udhu Billah min shaitan. Sorry, sir. Okay? Shaitan comes again. How about this officer? There's a clock on the wall. See that, the pendulum going on? How is it moving? See the... And now, you are inside and uh, studying the mechanism and... So throughout the salah, he is opening doors and you are closing them. He is opening and you are closing them. And that is jihad. That is jihad in the salah. So his, that is, he's there to just make you to have this satanic whispers to create doubts in your heart. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, the shaitan, inna shaitan ayati aharakum fi salati. Shaitan comes to you. And you know what he does? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, he blows at the back of one of you. Sometimes you feel there is gas came out. You feel it. And there's no gas. Shaitan blows. So the Prophet ﷺ said you should not leave the salah until you hear a sound or a smell. That means until you are dead sure, 100% sure, don't leave the the salah. Some brothers, this is quite often, often asked question, said, Akhi, when I passed urine and then I take wudu, I feel some drops are coming out. So I stay long time in the toilet. A man came to Ibn Abbas, he had this problem. Ibn Abbas told him, when you finish, after washing yourself, take a handful of water, spray it, and start your salah. Shaitan comes to you, oh, a drop of urine. No, it is water. <laughs> it's not urine, it's water. Don't ever open the door for the shaitan, otherwise your life will be miserable in the ibadah. You know some people, they have problem with the intention, the niya sheikh. Imam started reading the Fatha now and, the, and he's still, oh, I haven't got it. 
Huh? Looking for the near. Near is something tangible, you catch it? Huh? And then, ah, yeah, I got it now. <laughs> what is this? Near is something mental. If I meet you in the, well, in your way to the masjid, where are you going? Salah. Isha. Didn't you hear? So when you left your house, your intention is to pray the Isha. Allah knows about it. There's no need for you to say, Oh Allah, I'm intending to pray Isha for rak'az, ma'moom, huh? led behind the imam, facing the qibla. Of course you're facing the qibla. <laughs> no need to that. It's there. When you are taking your suhoor for Ramadan, and your little one said, Daddy, why are we eating at this time? Son, tomorrow is Ramadan. We are fasting. So niya is there. The niya is something mental preparation. Has nothing to do with utterance, has nothing to do with anything else. So don't open the door for the shaitan, otherwise he will confuse you. Okay? Oh, you didn't read the Fatha. No, I read it. For the people who have wiswas, that's how you can help them. Otherwise, no, you didn't read the Fatha. Read it again. Then, no, no, even you didn't read it correctly. So this is it. The shaitan is there and just to make your life miserable. Yes. Yes, you'd sahu, of course, when you are sure that you forgot. You make you'd sahu. For instance, now I am in doubt whether I prayed three rak'ahs or two. So I consider the minimum. And I add, if it is maghrib, add the third rak'ah. Then I make sujood sahu to sajda. So that's how to to get rid of the, these uh, thoughts of the shaitan. Uh, we'll take a final question, I'm afraid, because we're running out of time. We'll take it from the brother here, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Um, in Abi Dawood, there's a, there's a hadith when it speaks about five of the rights of a husband over a wife. Now, the fifth right mention is that the... Um, to not sever relationships other than with inside the house, within in the household. Um, obviously, we heard a narration from Ali radiallahu anhu with Aish, uh, with um, Fatima radiallahu anha. How do we reconcile between this? Like, what? It, when is it a case where we should leave the house to maybe go to the mas to the masjid, for instance, or that we stay and go into another room, for instance? The case of Sayyidina Ali is not. Uh to leave the house completely and go away for days and days. No, it was just a, a temporary thing that he just went to, to the mosque and uh, he got rest there until the Prophet Sallallahu came and uh, he asked Sayyidina Ali, what happened to you? Kum ya Abu Turab, stand up. And he mentioned him with his kunya Abu Turab. So this is uh, this type of temporary action that is needed because when you are in anger with your wife, either you have to apply those methods which are just mentioned here, including to cool down, to drink water, to change your movement, to go to the other room, be away from your wife at that time. And in the very same way, if you are uh, away from the house temporarily, it means uh, for, f for a few moments, for a few hours, that does not... Uh, uh, contradict the saying of uh, uh, the, the hadith in the Sunan Abi Dawood, it does not contradict. It only contradicts if it is, if it is uh, going away from the house completely, staying uh, away from the house for night and days. So we have to understand both hadith in their, in their context. So temporary type of uh, separation, th that is not uh, contradicting what is in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Jazakallah khair, uh, uh, brothers and sisters, and Jazakallah khair to our sheikh, uh, sheikh uh, for their time and answering those questions. We're going to conclude with that question, inshallah. Uh, we're going to now take a 30-minute break. Uh, we'll ask you to return back by 6 p.m. Just a reminder that the youth program is now finished, so those who have their children in the youth program or the creche, uh, please go to the youth program and creche and, and collect your children. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.